Thank you very much. You know, I was very fortunate uh, when I came to the Cleveland Clinic because there was this incredible registry of over a quarter of a million patients, a quarter of a million patient years and over 50,000 patients who had had bypass surgery. In addition to that, we had, I think, something like 12, 13,000 angiograms of vein grafts and arterial grafts. So it was a wonderful uh, amount of information for me to, you know, begin my academic career with. And what I'd like to do today is to share some of that uh, with you. And I think as we heard from Dr. Angelini, it really takes a dedicated surgeon. You know, we have dedicated surgeons to endovascular repair, to TAVR, to mitral valve repair. But coronary surgery just seems to be one of those things that everybody does. I would propose that the coronary surgeons of the future are dedicated surgeons who have focus on coronary revascularization. And I hope after today or after the talk, you will agree that we need to do more than one arterial graft to give our patients the best operations. So I, as I said, there was this incredible amount of information to me to work with. And the slide here, one of the ways early in, in uh, coronary vascularization at the clinic was they didn't have stress tests and they didn't have things, and so they would just follow patients by angiography. And Dr. Soans and Dr. Favillaro, and followed by Loop and Lytle, were very interested in what happened over time to bypass grafts. So one of the things that they would do, usually within the first year of surgery, is cath someone to see what their grafts look like. And on the left-hand panel, you see somebody who underwent angiography about one year after surgery. The upper panel is a vein graft. The second panel is a vein graft. And the lower panel is an internal thoracic artery graft. And you'll notice it's not to the LAD. You can tell it's a very old film. But you can see all three grafts look very nice soon after surgery. However, the next set of angiograms was at seven years. You can see the vein graft at the top now is totally occluded. The second vein graft has become aneurysmal and very atherosclerotic, very ugly, something we don't want to encounter at reoperation. But on the bottom panel, you see the IMA graft, which looks just as nice seven years later as it did when it was implanted. And when you talk to Dr. Loop and, and Dr. Lytle and Dr. Cosgrove, this is why they adopted the internal mammary artery, because they saw that over time, because of all this information they had available, that it was a stable graft. And they knew that the results of coronary surgery were totally dependent on whether the graft stayed open or not. It's a very simple concept. And so that encouraged Dr. Loop to look at if you had single, double, or triple vessel disease, and you had an IMA used versus all vein graft, how did you do? And you're all very familiar with the Sentinel paper that was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1986. A little history, it was turned down when he first submitted it to the New England Journal. But Dr. Loop, if any of you have met him, is a very persistent man and persisted for a year that they published this. He worked with Dr. Blackstone down in Alabama to improve the statistics, and they finally gave in. So probably one of them, I believe, is probably the most cited paper ever was first turned down. So we need dedication. We can't give up. This then, you know, the logical step, well, if one is good, isn't two better? Because we know the more our graphs stay open, the better our patients are going to do. And this was written by my colleague, Dr. Lytle. That showed that not only did it prolong survival, and that survival benefit tended to happen during the second decade of surgery, but it also uh, decreased the need of reintervention. Now, why is that? You know, as I said, if our graphs stay open, our results of surgery are better. So this was something I became very interested in, was understanding what drives graph occlusions, or why do graphs stay open? And there are kind of four general categories, and I think understanding these will help us understand why one and two IMA grafts are better than none. First of all, with time, grafts close. But this is not true for internal thoracic artery grafts. However, it's very true for vein grafts. It varies with the coronary artery. Grafts constructed to the LAD are more likely to stay open, whereas grafts constructed to the right coronary artery are least likely to stay open. The other arteries have intermediate patency. Competitive flow, you all are familiar with that. The less of the degree of native coronary artery stenosis, the more competitive flow, the more likelihood the graft is going to close. It turns out that's true for arterial grafts, but not for vein grafts. The conduit, again, vein graft patency is lower than IMA patency. And then there are certain characteristics about a patient, the patient's age, younger age, 
turns out to be a predictor of poor graft patency, female gender, and diabetes, most likely related to advanced disease. Again, when I started my career, it was kind of felt that, you know, arterial grafts only worked if the artery was badly stenosed. For instance, it had to be greater than 70%. If you had a moderate degree of stenosis, your vein grafts were less likely to work. The other thing, and I'm going to show just a series of, of depicting some of those four categories. Here you can see what happens over time to graphs. You can see in the yellow an IMA graft. It's very stable over time. And we had over 2,000 angiograms of IMA grafts. And the reason for that is IMA grafts do not develop atherosclerosis. If they fail early, it's due to technical problems or competitive flow. But they don't develop atherosclerosis, so if it's open, it stays open. That's not true for vein grafts. We know what happens to vein grafts over time. It's probably true that today they are better due to statin therapy and antiplatelet agents. However, there's a certain percentage that close early due to thrombosis. And then over time, you can have intimal plasia, which is probably a result of intimal injury that then leads to plaque formation, atherosclerosis, and a steady decline in vein graft patency over time. And this is why we see over time, the benefits of arterial grafting increasing because the vein grafts are closing and the IMA is staying open. As I said earlier, grafts constructed to the LAD are best, and grafts constructed to the right coronary artery are worse. The effect of competitive flow. And this was interesting because we all thought that under 70 percent we would see arterial grafts fall off very quickly. That turns out not to be true. There's actually a very slow, steady decline in patency, but it's not that great, suggesting that arterial grafts, and particularly internal thoracic artery grafts, at moderate degrees of stenosis have a very high likelihood of staying open. That's particularly true of the LAD. Competitive flow seems to have more an effect on non-LAD arteries, and this is probably driven by larger arteries, such as the right coronary artery, where degrees of stenosis are not good measures of competitive flow. Here you can see the, the stability of ITA patency uh, to the LAD over time, and not so true for the other coronary arteries, but again, still excellent patency out to 15 years. As I said, certain patient characteristics seem to decrease the patency of grafts, but only a little bit. You know, statistically, because of the number of grafts that we have uh, analyzed, it was significant, but probably in real life it doesn't matter. Now, how do we put all this together? Because one of the things I became very interested in is, well, if we're going to have the best outcomes, we need to choose the right graft for the right coronary artery with the right degree of stenosis. For instance, is there a coronary with a degree of stenosis that a vein graft might be better due to the effects of competitive flow? And so, again, as I said, we had over 12, 13,000 grafts to analyze. And we looked at this, and we brought all of those things in together competitive flow, artery graft, IMA patency, a vein graft patency, and looked at it over time. And what I'm going to show you is one and 10 year snapshots of the different coronary arteries comparing IMA patency to vein graft patency. All these graphs are going to look very similar. The IMA will be in yellow. The saphenous vein will be in red. Whether the graft is open is along the vertical axis, and then the competitive flow as represented uh, by proximal degrees of stenosis, is along the horizontal axis. And here you can see at one year, independent of the degree of proximal stenosis, an internal mammary artery graft is more likely to stay open than a vein graft. So even initially, it's better. How about at 10 years? As we said, what happens to those vein grafts is they develop intimal hyperplasia, which then develops into plaque and occlusion of the vein grafts we get a greater benefit of IMA grafting. Again, why the benefit increases with time and lasts into longevity. I think uh, the CAST study, they did a follow-up and looked at the patients who had arterial grafts, and what was evident in that study was the benefit of arterial grafts got better with time. It's kind of like a good wine. It ages well, where vein grafts do not. How about if we look, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at those arteries that have intermediate patency? Again, whether you graft the circumflex, the diagonal, posterior descending artery, or an arterial, an IMA graft is more likely to stay open with a vein graft. And again, this benefit increases over time. 
And this is why two IMA graphs are better than one. Now here's where we have our problem with the right coronary artery. And what do we do? If we put an IMA to a right coronary artery, it's really not that much better than a vein graft early on. And I think the reason for that is our understanding of competitive flow. You know, we're using proximal stenosis as a surrogate. We all know that competitive flow is going to be greater in a larger vessel with a 50% stenosis than a smaller vessel with 50% stenosis because the residual lumen will be larger. And it might be a problem with our, our measuring. And it might be important to take into, si into consideration the size of the residual lumen of the vessel in your arterial graft if you're going to graft the right. But it is a problem for us. We can see that over 10 years, however, the vein graft tends to close, the IMA stays patent. But again, we, we've all seen those short-term problems. But I think we can say for the most part, but when we use the IMA properly or in the best situations, it's going to be better than a vein. And that's whenever we're grafting an LAD diagonal circumflex or distal branch of the right. The problem is with main right grafting. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, as we heard a little bit earlier, and I'd like to talk about some of those situations where we wonder about IMA grafting. And this is from a presentation my research fellow did looking at patients with diabetes. Obesity is a huge problem in the United States. I'm always amazed when I'm in an airport now, the amount of obese people. And it's becoming a problem for us in the operating room as well. I know when I first started, it was very common to operate on people who might be 70, 80 kilos. Today, if I operate on somebody under 100 kilos, my nurse asks, what's going on? Patients are large, and they have diabetes. And for us, it's about 40% of our coronary practice. We looked at about 12,000 patients who had diabetics and tried to see, does bilateral mammary grafting make a difference in this group of patients? And what is the risk we're putting these patients at if we use bilateral ITA grafts. What we found, and it was no surprise, that if you had diabetes and had two arterial grafts, you were more likely uh, to live longer. And when we did an adjusted analysis, it was the only surgical thing that we could do that made a difference. Whereas off-pump surgery and whether you completely revascularized them or not didn't matter so much. But if you used two mammaries, you could help diabetic populations live longer. However, there's the Achilles heel of bilateral mammary artery grafting in diabetics, and that's the risk of deep sternal wound infection, which we're all worried about. And you can see that that was lower in patients having single ITA grafts. Other things in diabetics that increase the risk of wound infections were females, whether they had medically versus just uh, you know, uh, treated with their diet and vascular disease and myocardial, history of myocardial infarction. A continuous variable that was very important was their BMI. So you could argue that if you had a male patient who was not overweight, who did not have vascular disease, their risk of bilateral ITA grafting was quite low. However, you had an obese woman with vascular disease with a history of MI, her risk was going to be much higher. So I think we can use this data to counsel our patients. Then we ask the next question, which I think is probably more important, is if a patient with diabetes developed a deep sternal wound infection, did they do worse if they had bilateral mammary grafting? And the answer to that was no. They still benefited in terms of longevity, even though they developed a sternal wound infection. Now, all of you are rolling your eyes because we've all had that situation of the diabetic patient with the bad sternal wound infection that we didn't, we had problems taking care of. And I think this work comes in giving our patients informed consent and working with them very closely. But either way, Having bilateral ITA grafting still benefited the patient with the sternal wound infection who was diabetic. And you can see the importance of whether they're just diet controlled or medically treated, diabetes. So again, has long-term survival advantage, particularly in the diabetic population. They are at increased risk of deep sternal wound infection, but it still conferred a survival advantage. The one last thing I know that Dr. Angelini talked about is age. You know, is there an age where we get too old for bilateral internal thoracic artery grafting? And this is a little bit of a complicated slide. But what it shows is age along the bottom and then the increase in longevity, the percentage increase, whether you have one or two IMA grafts. And you can see that if a person who has at age 50 at 20 years has an 8% increase of survival. So if you had your operation at 50, 20 years later, you had an 8% increase in survival.
But you can see when you get down to 80 or so, there's really no difference. So I actually agree with Dr. Angelini. Probably over the age of 75 to 80, bilateral mammary arteries don't influence survival in the patient population. So we do have some age cutoff. But in summary, I think bilateral IMA grafting is the gold standard. It is our best graft with patency, and we know that patency gives us the best outcomes. And this is true in all populations. Although diabetics are at greater risk, they still derive a survival benefit. And probably for patients under the ages of 75 or 80, mammary artery grafting bilateral is indicated. Thank you.